Alcatraz, also known as The Rock, housed 1,576 of the United States' worst criminals. Even after they closed the doors in 1963, it still has a few unexplained guests that have stuck around. This is Three Ghosts of Alcatraz. Before today's video, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the latest videos. If you want to see a case or topic covered by Paranormally Listed, then go to criminallylisted.com and fill out the questionnaire under the Suggested Case tab. Number 3. Officer C. Royal Klein and Thomas Limerick On May 23, 1938, Officer Royal Klein was assigned to patrol the prison's woodworking factory. The factory was in the Mall Industries building on the island's northwest side. While on patrol, three inmates attacked him and beat him in the head with a hammer and scraps of metal. The inmates were 36-year-old Thomas Limerick, 22-year-old Rufus Franklin, and 26-year-old Jimmy Lucas. Limerick turned to crime after his father died at the age of 15 and his family became extremely poor. In May 1935, he was sentenced to life in prison for bank robbery and kidnapping. Lucas was serving 30 years for bank robbery and vehicle theft across state lines. He entered Alcatraz in January 1935. He would become known for attempting to kill the infamous Al Capone in the prison showers with scissors on June 23, 1936. Lucas slashed Capone and Capone punched him in the face before guards broke up their brawl. Capone wasn't badly hurt and Lucas was sent to confinement. Lucas said he attacked Capone because Capone threatened to kill him. Franklin had a 30-year sentence for vehicle theft across state lines, assault, and bank robbery. He had spent most of his life in prison. At Alcatraz, he spent most of his time in solitary confinement. While working in the Mall Industries building, the three inmates made an escape plan. They realized that they could access the roof from the woodworking shop. They attempted their escape on May 23, 1938. First, they attacked Officer Klein, who fell unconscious from the blows. The inmates dragged Officer Klein's body to a corner and then made their way to the roof of the Industries building. They planned to assault Officer Harold Stites, who was the guard in the tower. But Officer Stites had a rifle and could see the three inmates on the roof. Before they could make it to the tower, Officer Stite shot Limerick in the head and Franklin in the arm and the shoulder. Lucas surrendered. Amazingly, all three inmates were still alive. Other officers took them all back into the prison. Later that day, Limerick died from his wound. Officer Klein was brought to the hospital, but he never regained consciousness. Sadly, he died the next day in the hospital from head injuries. The 40-year-old father of four was the first officer killed at Alcatraz. Several tourists and guards have seen the ghost of a guard making the rounds of the building with a billy club. He looks in the direction of living tourists and guards with a suspicious look as if they're inmates. When people approach the ghostly figure, he shakes his head and disappears. May believe that this is Officer Royal Klein. Franklin and Lucas were later given life sentences for the first degree murder of Officer Klein. Limerick, the prisoner who died in the attempt to escape, replays the escape in his afterlife. Guards working in the tower overlooking the roof have seen a prisoner on the roof walk towards the tower. But then the inmate disappears in front of them. People believe that they are seeing Limerick's ghost, who is still hoping to escape to freedom. Number 2. Battle of Alcatraz Ghost One of the most legendary escape attempts at Alcatraz was also the bloodiest and most violent. By the end, three inmates and two correctional officers were dead, and 14 guards and one inmate were injured. 
the inmates who were killed were Bernard Paul Coy, Joseph Paul Kretzer, and Marvin Franklin Hubbard. And even in death, it seems they still can't escape Alcatraz. 46-year-old Coy was from Louisville, Kentucky. During the Great Depression, he couldn't find work. In 1923, he was fined $250 for violating liquor laws. He was charged with assault and battery. He couldn't afford the fine. He went to jail for larceny. On March 25, 1937, he walked into the National Bank at New Haven, Kentucky with a sawed-off shotgun. With two other men, they walked away with $2,000. They hid in a cave near a river. Three days later, farmers in the area saw smoke from their campfire and they called the police. On June 3rd, 1937, Coy was sentenced to 25 years in a federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia. Coy was a violent inmate and because of that, he was sent to Alcatraz on July 31st, 1937. At Alcatraz, he was violent and he tried to escape, which earned him time in solitary confinement. 35-year-old Kretzer was from Anaconda, Montana. He was in and out of reformatory schools for theft during his teenage years. In his mid-20s, he ran brothels. In 1938, a woman told the police she was unwillingly sold as a prostitute and beaten severely by Kretzer. For unknown reasons, he wasn't arrested. Instead, he went on to rob at least eight banks. Kretzer made his way to number four on the FBI's most wanted list. He drifted around the U.S., but finally got caught in August 1939. Kretzer was sentenced to 25 years for three bank robberies in Seattle. He was sent to federal prison in Washington, where he attempted an escape. On August 22, 1940, Kretzer attacked and killed a U.S. Marshal while in court custody for his attempted prison escape. He was charged with first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. 29 year old Kretzer was sent to Alcatraz on August 27th, 1940. Less than a year later, he attempted to escape the prison. He was caught and he was sent to solitary confinement. 30 year old Marvin Franklin Hubbard was from Alabama. By the time he was a teenager, Hubbard was committing violent robberies. In 1942, he was arrested for robbing a liquor store at gunpoint. He was sent to a jail in Alabama. In August, he and two other inmates assaulted a guard, stole a submachine gun and a revolver, and escaped from the prison. Once they were out, they stole a truck, tied the occupants to a tree, and abandoned them. They were eventually arrested. Hubbard was held at the Knox County Jail. He and the others escaped while they were arrested again. Hubbard was sent to a prison in Atlanta where he participated in a riot. This was his golden ticket to Alcatraz. Bernard Coy was the mastermind behind the attempted escape from Alcatraz in 1946. In 1945, Coy worked for the jail library, so he was allowed to wander around the prison to hand books out to inmates. He could even go to D-Block, which was otherwise off-limits to inmates who were locked up in that section. While exploring the prison, he realized he could pry open bars and squeeze through to get to the weapons storage room. He could then take hostages and escape the prison. Coy thought about which inmates he could ask to join him in his plans. They had to be people who could follow a plan and be capable of committing murder. Coy liked Kretzar and an inmate named Clarence Victor Carnes in on his plan. Carnes was at Alcatraz for murder and kidnapping. Over a couple of months, Coy lost more than 20 pounds so he could more easily fit through the bars to escape. He got a makeshift bar spreader with the help of another inmate in the machine shop. 
Koi often interacted with the guards and earned their trust so that he was able to make library rounds in the prison with little supervision. He also studied their habits and quirks. At around 1.30 p.m. on May 2nd, 1946, Hubbard was cleaning the kitchen. At the same time, Koi was polishing the dining room floors. As he was polishing, he moved closer and closer to Correctional Officer Miller. Hubbard walked past, and at that moment, Koi grabbed Miller's arms and held him down while Hubbard beat Miller into unconsciousness. Koi grabbed the guard's keys and locked the guard in cell 404. Then Koi ran to release Kretzar, Carnes, and another inmate. Koi then ran back to C-Block to grab the tools he had hidden. Kretzar spread axle grease all over Koi so they could more easily slip through the bars to access the weapons gallery. As planned, he used his makeshift tool to spread the bars that he squeezed through. Now, he was armed with guns. Koi opened the cells in the top two tiers of D-Block and the inmates emerged. Koi and Kretzar looked through the rings of the keys they had stolen from the first guard they attacked. They had no idea which one would allow them to access the recreation yard. They wanted to get to the yard to kill the tower guards and then leave through the yard door. They didn't know that Officer Miller, the first guard they locked up, had the key in his pocket. When no inmates were looking, he put the key in the cell's toilet. An officer named Ed Stucker had been in the basement through all this. He walked upstairs and saw the inmates standing around unsupervised, but no inmates spotted him. He knew something was wrong. He went back into the basement and tried to call the guards in the weapons and dining room, but no one was answering him. Three officers walked back into the cell house with only their clubs. The inmates threatened them and locked them in a jail cell. Kretzar searched for the missing key in the cell with the locked up guards, but he couldn't find it. Koi then put his hand in the toilet and found the key. But when the inmates tried the key to the yard, it didn't work. It turned out that the key had been designed not to work if it had been tampered with. By now, it was just after 2 p.m. A staff member at the prison sounded the emergency siren. The inmates knew the chances of escaping were slim because armed guards would be surrounding the building. Koi grabbed a rifle and opened fire. Other inmates joined in. Associate Warden Edward Miller walked into the cell house and he was met with Koi's rifle. A bullet missed Associate Warden Miller but it exploded in his face, which burned him. Prison officials called in off-duty guards. Meanwhile, the armed inmates were posted up in the cell house. Then Kratzar opened fire on the nine guards which the inmates had taken as hostages. By 3.30 p.m., Marines arrived and joined the Alcatraz officers. The officers and Marines entered the main cell house and a gun battle ensued. For hours, gunfire was traded back and forth. Early the next morning, a rescue team drilled holes in the prison ceiling and dropped grenades down on strings. By 11 a.m., bazookas were brought to the island. Two days later, on May 4th, at 8.40 a.m., Officers entered C-Block Utility Corridor. It was completely quiet. They came across the dead bodies of Coy, Hubbard, and Kretzer. Coy was wearing an officer's uniform. They had all died of wounds to the head. Officer William Miller and Officer Harold Stites had died during the fight. This is the same Officer Stites from our first story who shot and killed inmate Thomas Limerick as he tried to escape from the roof. Fourteen guards and one inmate were injured. Today, visitors to Alcatraz can still see grenade damage and bullet marks on the walls and floors. 
and the ghosts of three inmates who died still haunt the prison's halls. Their spirits are seen in the utility corridor where they died. We will hear clanging noises, gunshots, footsteps, and see shadow figures. One time, a night watchman walked through the corridor in her cries and moans. A reporter stayed the night in the utility corridor, and he said he suddenly felt really angry, and he had the urge to shoot someone. Number 1. Rufus McCain and the Red-Eyed Demon In the media, Alcatraz was nicknamed Devil's Island because of reports of inmates being treated harshly. When Alcatraz opened, inmates were barely allowed to talk and some said that the lack of social interaction was one of the hardest parts of being locked up. It was even worse for prisoners sent to the dungeon. The dungeon was a nickname for eight solitary confinement cells in the basement during the 1930s. They were located below A and D blocks in the prison. These cells were reserved for serious discipline. Some inmates said that they were thrown into these basement cells and had to sleep on cement floors without bedding or a pillow. There was no running water or a toilet and prisoners had to use a bucket as their bathroom. There were no lights in the cells, so inmates were in the dark, damp basement with poor ventilation. They were also barely given any food and mostly lived on bread and water. Inmates could be confined to these cells for several days. One inmate who spent time in the dungeon was Henry Young. Henry Young was born in 1911 into a low-income family in Kansas City, Missouri. Young left home at 19 and became a carnival worker. In 1932, he robbed a fellow drifter who left him gagged and tied up in a train boxcar in Montana. The victim was found freezing, but still alive. Young was arrested and sentenced to 15 months in prison in Montana. After he was released, he got away with several kidnappings and robberies around Washington State. In 1934, at the age of 23, Young robbed a bank in Washington and was arrested the same day. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison on McNeil Island in Washington. Young beat up and sexually assaulted other inmates. The warden of McNeil Island Prison said the Young was the worst and most dangerous criminal he's ever dealt with. The warden asked for Young to be transferred to Alcatraz, a prison for some of the hardest inmates. His request was granted. Young arrived at Alcatraz on June 1, 1935. Rufus McCain was another inmate who spent a lot of time in solitary confinement once he arrived at Alcatraz. McCain was the youngest of seven children, and their mother died when McCain was five years old. He left home at the age of 18 and worked in an oil field. In 1931, he stole jewelry and ceremonial artifacts from indigenous grave sites. He was caught and he was sentenced to one year at Oklahoma State Penitentiary. Once McCain was released, he couldn't get a job and he was running out of money, so he robbed banks. 32-year-old McCain was caught. He was sentenced to 12 years in an Arkansas prison. While there, he met another inmate named Sam Day. 23-year-old Day was serving a life sentence for killing a sheriff. In April 1935, they somehow escaped the penitentiary. On May 14, 1935, McCain and Day stole a car and drove to Idabel National Bank in Oklahoma. At around 1 p.m., they walked into the bank, unmasked, and yelled, This is a holdup. Stick your hands up. McCain had a sawed-off shotgun, and Day was carrying two pistols. The teller gave them $2,700. McCain and Day then grabbed two of the bank employees and intended to kidnap them. During the robbery, a woman walked by the bank and saw it unfolding through the window. She ran to a couple of nearby stores and told the employees what was happening. 
Two officers who were on the street heard the woman describe the robbery. Three other people on the street heard what was happening too, and they were armed. So all five armed people stood outside the bank with their guns ready. When McCain and Day left the bank, a firestorm ensued. A bullet hit Day in the right shoulder, and then the robbers surrendered. They were taken to the county jail. Three days later, Day died from his injuries. McCain was sentenced to 99 years for kidnapping, bank robbery, and endangering the lives of the bank employees. He spent a few months at the Leavenworth Penitentiary. In October 1935, he was transferred to Alcatraz because he was violent and considered a high risk for escape. In Alcatraz, his violent streak didn't stop, so he spent a lot of time in the solitary confinement cells in A and D blocks. McCain and Young met at Alcatraz. They also met Arthur Doc Barker, Dale Stamphill, and William Ty Martin. Barker was a member of the Bloody Barker Gang and had a long history of robbery and murder. Stamphill had a history of bank robbery and kidnapping. Martin was a post office robber. One day, Barker told Stamphill that he needed to escape from Alcatraz. So Stamphill made saw blades out of copper. Somehow, Martin, McCain, and Young got in on this escape plan. Over many days, they all saw the bars of their cells in D-Block. Stamphill made a wax cover where they cut so the guards would notice. In the early hours of January 13th, 1939, all of them cut through the bars fully. Then they pried open the bars of a window in D-Block and made their way to the shore. They all started looking for wood to tie together to make a raft. About half an hour after they broke out of their cells, a guard doing his rounds noticed the five prisoners were missing. A siren rang through the prison and all the guards started looking for them. The guards found all five men on the shoreline. Parker and Stamphill made a run for it. Guard shot Barker in the head and leg and Stamphill in the leg. Barker died from his wounds. The other three inmates surrendered. A rumor around the prison was that they managed to make a raft and got out onto the water. But McCain couldn't swim and made them go back to shore. Everyone but Young was placed in solitary in A block. Young was placed in D block. Over the next few months, Young was in and out of confinement in D block for violating prison rules. In December 1940, Young was put into a cell with the general prisoner population. He had a job as a janitor in the furniture shop in the Mall Industries building on the northwest side of the island. Also in that building was the tailor shop. On December 3, 1940, McKay went into the prison's tailor shop at around 10 a.m. Young was in the tailor shop. Young was armed with a shiv and he stabbed McCain in the abdomen. McCain was taken to the hospital ward where the shiv had been plunged into his artery and he died later that day. He was 37 years old. Rumors that Young blamed McCain for their capture and that's why he stabbed him. There was also a rumor that McCain made a death threat toward Young and Young got to him first. 29-year-old Young went to trial in April 1941. He said he had blacked out and he hadn't realized he stabbed McCain until later. Young's trial put a spotlight on the confinement practices at Alcatraz. Young's defense focused on how his long stretches in solitary confinement had caused him psychological damage. Young said he spent weeks in the dungeon without running water, clothing, or light. Other inmates testified that they were beaten by guards and thrown into the dungeons themselves. At the end of April, the jury found Young guilty of involuntary manslaughter. 
he had three years added to his sentence. At this point, Young had only served five years of his 20-year sentence. The jury also requested an investigation into the confinement practices at Alcatraz. The director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons wrote a report saying prisoners had misled the jury about the confinement conditions of the prison. It is unknown if the director had ever investigated the dungeon cells. The Bureau of Prisons maintains Young never spent time in the dungeon. What is known is that the bars were removed from the dungeon cells in 1938 and never used again. In October 1940, cells in D-Block were refurbished into isolation cells. There were 42 cells, and the most severe cell was called the strip cell. The strip cell was freezing cold and had no light, no toilet, or sink. There was a hole in the floor, and only guards could control when it was flush. Prisoners had no clothes in the cell and had a restricted diet. They would get a mattress at bedtime. People were usually put into the cell for a day or two. Five other isolation cells were nicknamed the hole, and they were on the bottom tier of D-Block. These cells had a sink, a toilet, and a light bulb. Their mattress was taken away during the day. Inmates were put in these cells for up to 19 days. The rest of the cells in D-Block were closed to the design of general cells except the construction allowed for better security. Prisoners in D-Block visited the recreation yard once a week and could only take two showers a week. In the years following Young's trial, he spent much more time in solitary confinement in D-Block. He started to act strangely. He stopped talking to the guards. In his cell, he would roll up his mattress and put it at the back of his cell and sit on it with his head in his arms. He would be in a catatonic state for days and refuse to eat. Young was sent to a medical facility but never received a diagnosis. He was paroled in 1972. He then disappeared and was never seen again. Even though Young was never seen again, McCain's ghost has been seen several times. People have seen a spirit running through the Model Industries building. Then suddenly, the ghost stops, clutches his stomach before falling to the floor, and disappears. Sometimes, people actually see blood coming out of his stomach. McCain is also said to haunt South 14D, while the solitary confinement cells in D-Block that has no comforts. McCain allegedly spent time in this cell. Now it's said to be one of the most haunted areas in the prison. Some believe that McCain's spirit is seeking revenge for his death. But if it is McCain, the scariest part about him in the afterlife is his glowing red eyes. Others believe it might not be McCain, but a red-eyed demon. Regardless, this entity terrified other inmates and guards when the prison was active. A few years after McCain's death, another inmate was thrown into cell 14D. He screamed that another inmate was in the cell with him and had glowing red eyes. The guards thought that he was making up stories to get out of isolation, so they ignored him. The man in 14D finally became quiet and the guards forgot about him for the night. The next morning, the guards opened the cell door and found him dead. He had scratches on his body, strangulation marks on his neck, and a terrified expression on his face. The coroner confirmed that the death was from strangulation, but not a suicide. Oddly, a day after the inmate was found dead in cell 14D, the guards counted the same number of inmates during the head count. Then they realized that they were staring at the prisoner who had died the day before in 14D. They all watched as his spirit just faded away. In the 1950s, inmates were eating dinner together in the dining area. One of the convicts became angry and threw his food tray at another prisoner. 
A guard brought the man to D block. The guard was particularly grumpy and beat out the prisoner before throwing him into isolation. Later that night, the guard was doing his rounds of D block and saw that the prisoner was standing in the hallway. The guard yelled for the inmate to stand still and keep his hands within view. The inmate just stared at the guard and he approached. Then the guard saw that the man's eyes were glowing red. The inmate with the red eyes just stood there. The guard was 10 feet away before he realized it wasn't the inmate he had thrown into solitary confinement earlier. The guard didn't recognize the inmate or thing standing in front of him. The creepy man grinned a menacing smile before it turned around and walked around the corner. The guard ran to chase the thing around the corner, but something hit him from behind and made him fall to the ground. At the same time, the guard heard laughter. He turned around and no one was behind him. He had no idea what shoved him to the ground or who was laughing. There were no intruders found in the prison. Every cell was locked up as they should be. In 1973, Bob Davis was 13 years old and visiting Alcatraz with his family. He volunteered to be locked in cell 14D. The tour guide put him in the cell and locked the door. Bob was in complete darkness. He heard the tour guide ask if he was alright from the other side of the door. And Bob said he was fine. Then he felt someone grab his shoulder and say in his ear, you're mine. Bob yelled to be let out as he pounded his fist on the door. At the time, he didn't believe in ghosts, but the experience later inspired him to start a research group called Planet Paranormal. The same thing happened to a man named Don Steggs a decade after Bob's experience when he was touring the prison. Someone or something closed the door of a cell on him and he was trapped inside the dark cell. He instantly felt a hand on his shoulder and heard someone whisper in his ear, You're mine. He could even feel breath on his skin. Stags wasn't scared at all and actually laughed. Then he heard a growl and the spirit disappeared. Stags was then able to open the door and get out. In the 1980s, a tourist entered cell 14D and the door shut on its own, locking her inside. She couldn't get the door open, so she yelled for help. She felt something groping her, but she couldn't see anyone in the cell. Then, she was finally able to open the door. Today, people report terrible smells, bad feelings, and extreme coldness in D-Block. T-Block is considered one of the most haunted areas of the prison. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash listed. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.